Well, hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Ron Baker. I'm the founder of the Verisage Institute, and I'm here with a great group of panelists to talk about accounting for the future, making the transition to advisory. I'm going to do a short presentation, bringing you some incredible research from Receipt Bank, and then we're going to jump in and to our panel, and we're going to discuss various aspects of making the transition to advisory with a group that has actually done it. So you're getting some bleeding edge stuff here from the experts in the profession that have already made this uh, transition as accounting professionals. So with that, let me show you some research that came out of the vibrant community of the Re uh, Receipt Bank users. They asked over 150 leading accountants and bookkeepers what billable advisory services they provide how to meet client demand with advisory services and how they package and bundle them. Because as you know, folks, you've been on the front line, just like the medical workers with this COVID crisis, while the medical experts keep us physically healthy, the, account, the accounting experts and professionals keep their customers financially healthy. And this is a perfect time to make a transition if you haven't done it yet to advisory services. So how to meet the client demand with advisory services, which advisory services are in most demand, and how should you package and bundle them? Well, our expert panel today has done all of that. So here are the things that Receipt Bank found, which, which are pretty interesting. These are the most in-demand advisory services, business health checks, procurement, cash flow modeling. I can't stress that enough. That's a big issue for small businesses. Stack tax simulations, management accounts, Business KPI setting and benchmarking, another massive area that I see all the time. Uh, financial planning, supplier risk, financial risk analysis. You could even add more to this. Um, cybersecurity would be another one that I see massive demand for among accounting professionals, customers. Uh, but as you can see, um, look what they're asking for. The customers are asking for their accounting professionals during this COVID crisis, cash flow forecasting 87%, applying for financial relief, the PPP loans that you're all probably helping your customers with, compliance work, even though there's a lot of people that are predicting since I've been in this profession that compliance is going to die. Compliance ain't gonna die, folks. It's getting more complicated, if anything. Uh, and then financial advice. So all of these things, are in demand and more. I could again, I could add more to this list, but I want I want our I want to bring in our panel now and ask them what have they been hearing and what have they been doing. So how we're going to do this? I'm going to start with Juliet, and I want each panelist to introduce themselves and then let and then answer this question for me. What does it mean to you, Juliet, when we say advisory? What, what does that term mean to you? Because I hear it all the time, advisory consulting. And so um, I'd, I'd love for everybody to answer that question after they introduce themselves. So Juliet, we'll start with you. Sure, I am Juliet Aurora. Thank you very much, Ron, for having me and Receipt Bank for having me as well on this esteemed panel. I look forward to, uh, to the discussion over the next half an hour or so. Um, and so, from my perspective for advisory, it more than anything else is satisfying a need for your small business owner clients outside of just doing the data entry side of it. So it can look like anything uh, from all the items that you listed, cash flow, um, tax simulation, but more than anything else, it's solving a pain point for them that involves their financial numbers more than just giving them a balance sheet and income statement. Excellent. Yeah, I love to say that advisory is all about helping our customers create the future rather than just reporting on it, like, Absolutely. like putting historians with bad memories. Erin, uh, how about you? Well, thanks, Ron. Um, I'm Erin Vukulich. I uh, work for a firm up in Montana. And for me, advisory is very much that uh, forward-looking uh, piece as opposed to just focusing on the historic information. It's what can we do in the future? And then I think what's really happened over the last seven to eight months is exactly what you said, Ron, uh, 
paying attention to the health of the business and uh, offering solutions and um, analyzing the information to come up with um, how we can keep businesses healthy into the future as we move forward. Excellent. And Dan, how about you? Uh, yeah, my name is Dan Luthi. I'm with uh, IgniteSpot Outsourced Accounting. Um, I'm, I'm the same as these guys, but I'm also a little bit different from that aspect as well. I look at advisory, not only just from the financial aspect and providing forecasting and a visualization from a dollars and cents standpoint, but we also take it a little bit further and look at more process opti optimization as well and taking it into kind of an end-to-end -end view with our clients and um, evaluating how they can save time and resources as well and, and evaluating it on both perspectives and bringing both of those together from visual, visualization for our clients also. Did any of you see out of those services that Receipt Bank found, do any of you, besides what you just said, Dan, about process, is, are there other things that you're finding that are in great demand? Sure. So for us, one of the newer services that seems to be cropping up over and over again, um, especially with COVID and a lot of businesses moving to the cloud, is conversions. Um, converting to a cloud product from a desktop product. And I would consider that advisory. That is certainly something that you're helping a business with outside of the data, uh, the data entry side. So that's a big one that we've seen is conversions and setting up an ecosystem where different programs are talking to each other. Yeah, I think just to add along with what Juliet was saying there, um, a lot of clients are that we're seeing are coming in from having people who are have been stuck in an office for a long period of time who aren't used to utilizing apps or utilizing, utilizing an ecosystem in any way, shape or form. And you're helping them to transition in that space or move over into setting up a structure and uh, helping them to, to transition mentally into that piece. And so you're, you're not only looking at apps, but you're also looking at um, an infrastructure that's outside of those pieces, but also looking at how all of this is going to help them geographically, but also helping their growth forecast as well from that piece. Um, sometimes it's looking at market structure for their organization and looking at how that potentially impacts them as they're looking for their growth. And so um, all of those things, I think, uh, tie heavily into our involvement with client relationships as well. Erin? Uh, I would add on with what Juliet was saying and kind of what Dan was saying as well. We've seen a lot of requests for process review and ecosystem review, especially as more and more people are needing to work remote or they can't come into the office or the manufacturing wing or um, any other things that involve going into different places where a lot of people are. So uh, we've seen a really large increase in clients asking for just another pair of eyes to come look at that information and help them analyze what's going to be best for their business going forward. And I'm just interested in this personally, because I, I work in this space, but have any of you done any KPI analysis for your customers and or pricing consulting? Because it's another massive area. Small businesses need help with pricing, just like accounting professionals do? Does anybody offer that service? We've definitely started doing more of the KPI and the pricing analysis, uh, especially as uh, margins are changing pretty quickly right now. Um, we have a set uh, number of KPIs that are kind of standard, but then we spend a really pretty significant amount of time talking to the client to figure out what exactly they want, what are their goals to determine what those KPIs should be and how we should build them into whatever system we're using. Uh, so that's a pretty common thing that we're adding on to just our regular advisory or um, bookkeeping accounting services. How about you, Dan? Yeah, depending on our contract, I mean, depending on the agreement that we have with our client, it's definitely a part of those services that we do offer. Uh, it is definitely becoming far more common for us to have client discussion regarding uh, pricing allocations. I mean, uh, customers are always looking at number one, first, they're always question is, is are we charging the right price for, are we charging enough? Um, last week, I just had a conversation with a, a customer who was trying to determine uh, how to give raises to some of their employees. And, and we had to have that deep discussion regarding their price as it compared to the cost of goods sold. And, 
And that was a, it was a very concerning conversation when we showed him the valuation that is it has showed through it and the detail as it, as it, uh, as it related to the overall cost segregation, as it related to each individual job that was going along with it. And as the market tied back to that from the evolution that's been going on specifically over the last six months within their space, um, really was eye-opening to that customer specifically. And so being able to have those conversations and to dive deeper into those, those spaces with those individual clients is, um, is very eye-opening also for us, but also um, for clients when you get to interact with them and be able to, uh, to transition, especially for clients who are used to um, not looking at that as often as they should. Juliet, how about you? Uh, for us, I guess it's similar to Aaron, is that yes, KPIs has been a big part of the conversations that we have with our clients when we sit down with them monthly to go through their financials. And it is driven by what's important to them. What are they trying to measure? You know, what's their, their 12 month goal? What's their five year goal? And interestingly enough, it sometimes is us asking that question that makes them think about, well, what do they want their business to look like in 12 months or five years that they wouldn't normally. Um, but so no, definitely KPIs. And from the pricing standpoint, more so um, the niche that we're in is e-commerce. And so from the pricing standpoint, it mostly is, you know, are my gross profit, what are my profit margins and are my prices enough to cover all the different fees that Amazon kind of layers on. So that's kind of where we are on the pricing, um, on the pricing spectrum with consulting. Excellent. You know, Receipt Bank also uncovered these four insights that we're showing uh, about packaging advisory work. And I, I, I love all of your answers because it's so individualized or like we sometimes say, it's, it's bespoke. You know, you're doing very customized work. And my favorite definition of a professional is someone who is responsible for creating an outcome rather than providing a task. And it seems like when you would offer these advisory services that you're able to transform your clients from where they are to some desired future state, you're, you're transforming them. And when you offer transformations like that, the client is the product, not your services. It's at, you're actually touching the client's soul, their life, their dreams, their hopes, um, and, and so I guess my question is with that, where do you begin when you're, when you're trying to offer these services? How, how do you identify the customers to even present this to, have a conversation with, um, and are, custom, are some customers more receptive than others? So Aaron, I'll start with you. So I guess I'll start with the, the question regarding finding the clients that are the right fit. And I think this is a hard thing for accountants traditionally to answer. Um, always in the past, we take in on all clients that come to us rather than evaluating clients for the right fit, the right culture fit, the right um, value proposition fit. Uh, and so I think for us as accountants, that's what we have to look at. We have to determine what's our culture, what's our value, and make sure that we're matching that up with our clients. Uh, I found that when I'm working with clients that have the same culture and value structure, it's so easy to bridge that conversation and say, hey, what else can we be doing for you? What can we do to get you onto your next goal? Or what are your goals and how can we help you get there? Uh, if they are a match for us, then having that conversation is a is it's still a little intimidating, but much easier as opposed to trying to have that conversation with someone that just isn't the right fit. Uh, but maybe they're a great fit for the accountant that works down the road and that's a better, better option for them. So I think understanding our own culture, value, all of that and bringing on clients that match that are really important in starting that conversation. Excellent. Dan, how about you? Uh, I agree with Aaron on a lot of those topics. I think along, also along with that for us, some of the key pieces we like to do is initially have those conversations with the client regarding what in their mind they're looking for. 
Uh, sometimes clients come to you with a, with initial expectation because they had a conversation with someone else and in their mind, they talk about a cash flow forecast and they talk about some of these initial things that were presented to them. And when you start to talk with them about it, um, they may start visualizing something a little bit different about what it is that they're looking for. And they may start you know, communicating with you a more holistic story of what it is they'd like to see when, when everything starts to come to fruition. And when you can be a part of that and when you can start to understand more holistically what it is that they're looking for, now, now it becomes more of a relationship as a part of that process. And when you feel like you as a, as a partner can be able to can truly connect and be able to deliver that, it becomes a whole different process. And so as we start collecting that information from our end and we start connecting those two pieces together, um, we try to take three different uh, kind of three different bits of information together as we start preparing our, our content for our clients. And that's one, of course, is their financial information. Um, and then a second piece, of course, is the, uh, the economic impact, which is going on around them and outside of them, uh, depending on their niche, depending on what's happening uh, within their area, depending on everything from those areas, but also their individual goals and expectations. Um, all of those things tie together with regards to what ends up being their story and what ends up to being what they can particularly, particularly achieve. Um, it's easy to be able to say your financials will allow you to do this. And so here's your cash flow forecast and as it relates to it, or here's what the market says you can do. And here's a cash flow forecast on how it, how it, you know, what it portrays. But if you don't tie all three of those together and communicate that story with them from that initial interaction, you're not going to be able to really portray and help them to be able to achieve actually what they're looking for and help them to be able to advance that beyond into not just providing that cash flow forecast in the beginning, but into further projects, which maybe end up doing a, you know, a cost analysis and, and diving into all the other services that you could potentially provide. And so uh, by providing that deep relationship investment, that really is where you become a part of their team. Uh, much like I think, you know, Ron, you mentioned in the beginning, and when you were talking about this, you were talking about you become invested in who they are. You become invested in what they become. And now you become a partner in their strategy. You become a partner in their success. And those two things together become welded, welded together in, in really working towards their ultimate goal, which is achieving their future, whether it's to exit their business or to their retirement to where they ultimately sell off or pass it on to their children. That's excellent. Wow. There, there's a lot to unpack there, Dan. You made me think of many things, but Juliet will go to you. <laughs> well, I'm not sure I can follow up anything or add anything onto Dan's uh, extensive list there. Um, I guess for to, to answer your question about how we find those clients, I think more than anything, it's your messaging that you're putting out into the world um, on your website. If you're networking, you have referral partners. And, and I think it is. Um, where you're not just talking about the compliance piece and you're talking. So for us, for example, we talk about providing them real-time financials that can help them make better business decisions. As opposed to saying, we can help you file your tax return. It's, we can actually, we want to help you make better business decisions. And so right off the bat, you are setting the expectation that we're doing this work because we want to help you make better business decisions. So what information do you need that's going to help you do that. And that's where we want to come in. So it's, I think for me, for us, it starts with the messaging right from the beginning that you're putting out um, to attract the clients. I, I love that, Julia. Just one thing to add on the end of it, like to your comment, it's also adding on it that piece of, I noticed this when I was doing a review of your tax return, or I noticed this, do you mind if we take 10 minutes to talk about this further? Like those little tidbits, like change the whole dynamics of a conversation with the client because now they feel like your value just, I mean, all of a sudden it's not just a transactional relationship anymore. It's we're diving into it. We're investing into you. We want to make this more in what we're trying to provide to you. And I think that most people who um, are, are venturing into the advisory or adding advisory and want to be able to add that extra piece um, in their services tend to do diagnostics up front. And then because you're doing the diagnostics up front, it allows you to have those conversations that Dan is talking about. And then Juliet, you, you mentioned that you were niched in e-commerce. Yes. Is, is that 
is that like an exclusive niche for your firm? Is that the only type of customer you go you go after? No, um, no, we have more than one, and we're Canadian, so it's niche, not niche. Right, um, right. I understand. Yep. Um, <laughs> so we up. have so we focus on e-commerce and construction, but we do have services service offerings for other clients as well. That's just where our marketing is targeted. Right. And and Dan, how about you? Are you is your firm niche? We are not. We're we're a general practitioner. Okay, Aaron. I would say uh, so. We have six different offices, and each office has its own little niche. But we're much like Dan in that we're pretty pretty much general practitioners. Though we do have little sp specialties, I guess you could say. Right, right. Because it seems to me that firms that are niched have a somewhat of an advantage because they've kind of seen everything that could ha possibly happen in that niche, you know, growth, selling, bringing in extra partners, whatever it might be. Uh, and, it, it, and, and I know there's a big movement out there uh, to, to get firms to niche and to specialize more. Uh, is that a trend that you're, that you've considered or are thinking about any, any of you to, to niche down more, put in, in other words, put yourself in a smaller box I'll definitely add some thoughts to this. I know Aaron and I have talked quite a bit about this. Um, being being a little bit smaller firm um, than than Aaron, we we've talked about this quite a bit. This is one of those things for us as a firm, as we've decided to kind of move forward. We we actually have made the decision not to, and we've made the decision not to because for us, um, we feel like our I guess you could say our niche is not necessarily an industry specific. Uh, our niche is more a, a a client base, meaning for us, it's not necessarily a industry. It's more of a, uh, a customer size uh, from that standpoint or a revenue specific or a, a customer need that we're, we're looking to, to service and, and customers who are looking from that standpoint. And so, um, you know, not, not necessarily that from, you know, from Juliet's standpoint, she's decided to focus on e-commerce, which I absolutely love from that standpoint. So you can fine tune apps and ecosystems and development from that standpoint. Ours is for us, it's much more around the processing side of things and making sure that we're setting up and make, uh, small businesses between kind of one and 15 or one to 20 employees and making sure that we're helping them to transition from doing things themselves or transitioning from doing things less efficient than what they've done previously, helping them to work into that growth scale and moving on from that standpoint or helping them to kind of evolve from having someone in house to have utilizing a, uh, an outsource provider and working from that development and, and scaling from, you know, $500,000 in revenue into that 10, you know, $10 million in revenue space. And so um, not that we love necessarily the startup piece where they're trying to scale from 500,000 to, you know, 10 billion in the next five years, but really those people who are that um, kind of small mom and pop shop who are really trying to grow into uh, something that their development is looking for long term, much like us as an organization that started, you know, 12 years ago and working through that same kind of building something that could be a legacy for their family and building something could be uh, something very similar to who we were and from when we started. I'd have to say we're somewhat similar to Dan when <laughs> we thought about niching out and uh, luckily, we have a larger staff and more offices, so we could niche out if we wanted to. Um, but really, for us, it's a, become about that that culture and value fit. So while we do well in certain industries like nonprofits, we also work with construction and agriculture and kind of all across the state. Um, I would say now we're focused more on making sure that that client has the same values as us or the same culture, that's that's definitely where we're going because we know that we can provide a great client experience for the clients that match kind of what we believe. So um, that's definitely where, where we're niching is into a culture value fit, not so much a specific industry. I guess what I'd like to add is we've recently made the decision to choose the two niches. And I'm still going to say niche, even though I'm on a panel of Americans. <laughs> um, probably over the last year. So for the last 10 years, we have been general. I guess last 19 years, we've been general. And there are advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, 
doing it the way that we're doing it now, where we are focusing on specific industries, the advantage for us is that we, we, as Dan said, we know the apps, we can create the ecosystem and we know them inside and out. And we can give some metrics that are specific to that industry based on what other, other clients are doing, or we see a process that a client is doing on this e-commerce store. And yeah, that's a great idea. Let's share it with the rest of our clients to help them to benefit them as well. But what you lose is when you're a generalist, sometimes the best ideas that you can give your clients comes from a completely different industry. And if you've narrowed your focus down so much that you're only living in that one industry, you don't necessarily get the input of you know, maybe a, a, um, a farm doing something that you would never connect to e-commerce, but it could fundamentally change the way that someone is approaching something. So I think you, you lose a little and you gain a little. It depends on, I think more than anything, it depends on what you want your firm to look like and you decide. Um, both ways work. It, and the great thing about being your own boss is you get to decide what you want your firm to look like. Sure. No, that's great. That's great. I mean, this is an entirely different session. If we could talk, this is wrap, gets wrapped up in strategic planning and your firm's positioning. Um, but I also want to ask all of you, how do you go about marketing these services? And, and let me add, since pricing is one of the four P's of marketing, how do you price these services? Do you bill them by the hour? Do you package them up into a fixed price? Do you offer options, three options when you price these services? So uh, Aaron, why don't I jump to you? So I would say we are in a bit of a, uh, some we're having some growing pains as a firm. Uh, there are some of us that really believe in the value pricing module or the concept of value pricing. Um, but how do we get there and how do we communicate the value to our clients or how do we make sure that we're understanding the client's value of our services? So uh, we typically start out um, building a couple of different proposals with different levels of services and letting them choose from there. But then we have a really open conversation about the pricing with the client on the onset of the engagement. And then we are working to uh, reevaluate that pro uh, pricing about between four and six months into the engagement to make sure that we are meeting their expectations, hopefully exceeding them, <laughs> but most of the time making sure that we're meeting those um, those needs that they had, the wants that they had, the things that they value most that were providing all of that information and all of the conversations that they wanted to have. Um, so we still have some offices that do hourly billing, uh, but we are in the process of really driving that value pricing conversation across the whole firm. So it's a struggle, but we're getting there. <laughs> sure. No, it's it, look, if it was an easy transition, most firms you know, right now, hourly billing would be dead. Unfortunately, it's not. Definitely. And how about you? Uh, we do uh, we do monthly fixed fees. So our fixed fees are based off of uh, predetermined uh, kind of agreements based from our initial reviews from our clients, um, based off of frequency of service and kind of initiatives from that standpoint. But uh, they start with initial conversations discussing with their clients what they're looking for from a service based standpoint. Um, so what kind of services they want to include, the evaluation from there, from that, uh, from that progression. Um, as you add frequency of service, you know, scale up from semi-monthly to weekly to semi-weekly, um, the more touch point we have, the more advisory you're getting in those, those frequencies. Uh, same thing from our, um, you know, more advanced when we add our CFO level services to it as well. Um, our semi-monthly or monthly to semi-monthly to, to weekly services, the more touch points you're getting. And so um, when we have a semi-month or a semi-weekly, you know, bookkeeping or accounting service contract, there's a whole lot more in-depth con conversations we're having with you where it's deep dives into everything that's going on that we're touching and that's happening with those, those entire valuations and what's happening. And so um, so much different as we compare to the processes of what's, what's evaluated and how we go from there. But it's we're not doing hourly billing in any way, shape or form on those. Um, 
unless there is a, uh, unless there's just a one crazy one-off need from the client at that point in time, um, where periodically we'll do an hourly contract with them. But in most cases, it is uh, us determining what we kind of feel like it's worth um, to that client and the need from that standpoint and where we feel like our value is. If it's something we've done before um, and we'll kind of determine that uh, we kind of feel like what it will take to us. Sometimes it's more of the kind of how much of a pain is it to take care of this or not um, in comparison. But, uh, but in those cases, all, you know, a lot of times we try to be we try to be very reasonable with our clients because we want our clients to stay long term. Our goal is not to, to have fluctuating costs to our customers. Uh, we want them to be to have a consistent fee that's reasonable um, as they add services and as they, they fluctuate over time. We do it then, of course, increase. Um, to, to manage those pieces as we go with it. But uh, we do have fixed fees that are, are value-based as best we can. Excellent. Juliet, how about you? So I heard you speak at one of the, um, what was uh, IPBC? You did a value pricing presentation, I'm going to say six years ago. Um, and we were um, fixed fee before that. And I remember coming back from that conference and, and telling my partner and saying, Okay, we need to move to value pricing. Um, we're not doing fixed fee anymore. So we've been value pricing for about six years. Um, not doing it well at the beginning, doing it much better now. And when we're uh, putting together packages, we do three packages for our, our potential clients. And the lowest package never has advisory in it. If they want any sort of advisory, it's always little or higher. We do distinguish between frequency. Um, on the advisory side, that can be a, a distinguishing factor between the middle and the, and the higher end. But, um, but no, we don't do any advisory in the, the bottom package, just the top two. Excellent. And has that been working out for you? Do your customers appreciate being offered options? Absolutely. They love it. Absolutely. They love it. They always they feel like they're making a choice as opposed to I just saying, here's a price. Um, here's our hourly rate. Here's our fixed rate. They feel like they're in control. And there are discussions as well. Um, sometimes we, what we put in the higher level package, they know that they can't afford it right now, but it is something that they want, but it's always in the back of their mind as well. So we're, we're also introducing services that they may not need now, but will in the future and will come to us when they, when they need them. That's excellent. Anybody else got anything to add to that? I wanted to add on to what Juliet said. Uh, we're doing the same thing of offering the different tiers. And we've seen the same, same result by maybe someone isn't quite ready for that top tier level, but they know that we offer those services. So we're already in back of mind as they're thinking, well, I might want to do like a retirement plan. And so we need some advisement about that. Like, oh yeah, we talked about that way when we did the the first proposal, it was in the options. So um, I think that's a, a really good way to get the idea in the client's head that, okay, we might not need this now, but I'm already thinking about it for the future. Uh, very much the same as, as both Juliet and Aaron. We historically, a lot of times I think accountants generally either wait for clients to reach out to them to say, hey, your fees are too high or I need something else. Uh, so we started to uh, to put in more standard proposal reviews. And so we're reaching out and having those deeper conversations with our clients regarding the current services, additional mm -hmm. things that we're rolling out that are new, um, also including, you know, at the start of conversations in the sales calls, if we, you know, if a client does show in, in interest in CFO services or in something else, we put it as optional at the bottom of that proposal so that when they do look at it again, or if they do pull it back up or something from that standpoint, that it's there. And that we do bring those up as a part of reoccurring discussions so that they can see that as, as something that there was there available, that is still something they should consider. And so those pieces get to still continually snag them. And then, of course, we always pump them out as a part of our marketing material to them as well of things that we do offer uh, from our firm as well that can help them to continue to grow their business. Excellent. Well, well, guys, this has been fantastic. And we've got about five minutes left, but I want to ask you, what, what does your current tech stack look like? And, and how does your tech stack enable you to provide better advisory services? Juliet? So we are a 100% um, QBO firm. So QBO is at the core. 
of our tech stack. And I'm assuming you're just talking or you're just asking about advisory um, tech apps, correct? Yeah, or anything actually, but advisory, yeah, for sure. Okay, so from the advisory standpoint, the two that we probably live and breathe the most out of our Fathom um, mm -hmm. for our KPI reporting and our consolidations, that was a big one for a lot of our clients where they never had consolidation ability across financials. Um, so Fathom is a big one for us. And then the other one is, is cash flow tool, which has become a lot more important over the last six or seven months for a lot of our clients. Um, but when whenever we're doing any kind of cash flow performance um, analysis, it's cash flow tool. Excellent. Erin? I would have to say our tech stack, we're very similar to Julia in that we have a pretty strong QBO base. Uh, we definitely still have some clients on desktop and um, a couple other uh, more industry specific general ledger systems, but kind of bringing it back to our sponsor for this receipt bank, um, they've enabled us to get the information quicker. Uh, so it's more timely. So we can actually do real time advising because now clients are submitting everything through receipt bank. It's going into QBO and then going into fathom, which is our chosen um, kind of advisory system that we use. So, Receipt Bank really allowed us to get the information in right away, as opposed to waiting for bank statements or the client to drop off receipts or mail them in. So um, I think advising is not just the, the software that we use for you know preparing the KPIs or anything like that, but also making sure that we're getting accurate and timely information. Dan? Um, no, I... I completely echo both uh, Juliet and Aaron on that. Um, definitely along with what Aaron's saying uh, regarding receipt bank, receipt bank's a big part of us and transitioning and gathering core information. Um, we utilize bill.com as well as a big piece and up in the beginning um, from an expense standpoint, along with that, uh, Divi is a big part of our world and introducing Brex as well into it this year. Uh, all, all four of those pieces have been really helpful in, in being able to be more involved in getting data faster for our clients so that it's not end of the month uh, for, for customers to be able to have interaction. Um, but much like Juliet said, for being able to create much more versatile reporting information for our clients from our, from our bookkeeping and controller level services, um, Cashflow Tool and Fathom have been phen phenomenal. Um, they've been really great for us to be able to, to really have a much more live KPI, much more flexible functions from there. Um, I know that some people will hate me for saying this, but uh, from our CFO standpoint, um, they really like Excel. They really love the ability to be able to take the deep dives in there and have the customization. I know there's a lot of people that uh, that dive into other tools from that standpoint. And I, I do got a lot of love for some of the other features and customization that goes along with. Uh, I'll do a shout out for Drav because I do really like the, the flexibility that goes along with it and the customization there. Um, but, um, but our team really does love the flexibility and the customization that they have with it and the tools they've built within it, um, just because it allows them to on the fly make those changes while they're meeting and, and going through with their clients and, and going through that. But, uh, um, but I think those are kind of the big pieces for us and just being able to have that, uh, have those lives. I mean, the dashboards and relationship that uh, you can create with a, a Fathom report and share that with a client is, is really hard to beat right now. And I mean, Right now, I'm really excited also for them to be re rolling out cash flow tool or cash flow reporting, which will be pretty cool uh, to be able to show that uh, pretty soon to our clients as well on a monthly basis, too. So that'll be uh, pretty unique. Excellent. Well, I'd like to thank Receipt Bank for sponsoring this session. And folks, please check them out at receiptbank.com. But we've only got a minute or so left. I'm going to ask each and every one of you, give me a one word response why you love Receipt Bank. Juliet. Game changing. <laughs> that's that's big, Dan. Simplicity. Beautiful, Aaron. Of course, you make me go last. Um, I would have to say ease of use with hyphens. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. Well, Juliet, Aaron, Dan, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. You guys are at the the leading edge of this. Uh, 
moving into advisory. I think it's the growth area and is definitely the future of the profession. Folks, that's about all the time we have for the panel discussion. Thank you so much for uh, joining us.